Welcome to Pittman and Friends, the curiously probing, sometimes awkward, but always revealing conversations between your host, Anne Arundel County Executive Stuart Pittman, that's me, and whatever brave and willing public servant, community leader, or elected official I can find who has something to say that you should hear. This podcast is provided as a public service of Anne Arundel County, so don't expect me to get all partisan here. This is about the age-old art of government, of, by, and for the people. I am here today with the Honorable Carl Snowden, author, activist, former alderman, former, almost former mayor, uh huh, former director yeah. of the Maryland Civil Rights Office under Doug Gansler, Attorney General Doug Gansler, and uh, aide to both County Executive Janet Owens and Governor Paris Glendening. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. All right. Can, can I call you Carl on Please here? Please do. Of, okay. <laughs> you can call me Stuart. That's what we do. Um, so so uh, I just want to note that even though you have all those formers uh, with your name and all these things that you've done inside and outside government, uh, I believe that you are more influential today as the convener of the Caucus of African American Leaders than uh, I would... I don't really know, but I think than you've ever been, that um, your ability to influence what's going on at the city, the county, and the state level um, is uh, really pretty extraordinary. And as an old community organizer, that's a compliment. Uh, you're, 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 working, you're working things um, from behind the scenes, and that's what I want to talk to you about, is some of that work. So why don't we start with, um, tell the listeners how you, you know, as a, even as a young person, got involved in activism and and, um, and and don't forget the part about kick, getting kicked out of Anne Arundel County Public <laughs> Schools and ending up at Key School, if you if you would. Uh, Stuart, there is, if you ask an African American, when does he, when did he recognize that race played a factor in one's life? One would think that people would automatically assume from the moment he grew up, but that's not necessarily the case. I grew up in Davisonville, Maryland. I grew up on a farm. And I will I've never been there. <laughs> Me I, too. Right. I had a friend whose name was Tommy. And Tommy was this incredible guy. Him and I were inseparable. When you uh, had him grown up on a farm, you know the forest of the woods was your playground. Mm -hmm. And what a playground we had. Boy, the, amazing. You get on a log, and that log could become a spaceship. Mm -hmm. You could put some twigs or uh, sticks between your legs and become your horse. Mm -hmm. You're only limited by your imagination. And when I was growing up, maybe I was six or seven, five or six, seven, something like that. I uh, remember working uh, on the farm with Tommy's father. His name was Mr. Marshall. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Marshall was this kind of guy who didn't say much, but when we spoke, you listened to a commanding experience. And Tom and I uh, loved growing up on that farm. We were inseparable. Tommy loved his father. He just loved his father. His father's a mm -hmm. big, strong man, six feet, five inches tall. And we would see him cut wood. He had the ability to be able to <sighs> take calf put it on his shoulder. This man mm -hmm. was an incredibly strong man. In those days, to plow the field, you didn't do it with a tractor. He had a wooden plow he would put on his back and mm -hmm. plow up the field. Mm -hmm. And his vocation and avocation was the same, hard work. God, he was mm -hmm. an incredible guy. Mm -hmm. One day, Tommy and I were playing in the forest, uh, in the woods as we had done so many times before. And... <clears throat> Tommy had told me at one point that his father was stronger than Superman. And in my age at that time, I didn't think anybody was capable of being stronger than Superman. Then Tommy told me his father could beat my father. Mm -mm. And I never conceded, but he probably could. Mm -hmm. Mr. Marshall was an incredible man. One day Tommy and I were playing, as we had done so many times before, and I did not know what a sharecropper was. Tommy's father was a sharecropper. Um, we were playing, and all of a sudden, the man who owned the property um, that Tommy's father lived in 
came toward us. He was angry. You could just see it. And in the old days, you may recall, people would put snuff in their mouth and you chew it, tobacco. Mm -hmm. And you spit the back out as you're walking. So this guy's walking along, he's got this tobacco in and he's just angry. And we could sense it, we knew something was wrong. But in those days, you could not interfere in adult business, you just didn't. Mm -hmm. But Tommy and I was curious as to what was going on. So we ran ahead of this man and hid in some bushes so we could see him, but he couldn't see us. And this man arrives at Tommy's father's house and start knocking on the door real loud. Mm -hmm. Tommy's father is in the house, but it's Tommy's mother that comes to the door. And the man says, where's Marshall? And she says, he's sick. He's sick, boss. He can't come to work today. He's sick. And the guy just goes in, brushes aside the mother, goes inside. And there's this cacophony of sound. It didn't take a long time, but it seemed like forever. It's a bright August summer day. Out walks Mr. Marshall, followed by his employer, and Mr. Marsh has no, no shirt on, he has no shoes on, just a pair of pants, and he is telling Marshall, you either come to work today, or I want you off my land, out of my property. And Mr. Marsh is trying to protest, and he takes his hand, he shoves Mr. Marsh, catching him off balance. And as he falls down in this dust, uh, he spits on him, that tobacco spit. Mm. For me, for that moment, everything stopped. I thought, sure, I would see this cacophony. I was on the brink of seeing this incredible violence. I saw how strong Mr. Marshall was. Mm -hmm. I know what power he had. But Mr. Marshall did something I have never forgotten. And as I tell it to you today, I can remember it just as if it was yesterday. Mr. Marshall says, I said, sorry, boss. Please don't fire me. I need my job. And as he's getting up, because the man says, if you want your job, then come on, get up, get on to work. So as he's getting up, he catches Tommy and I, because we're hiding behind his brushes. He sees us. Tommy's crying profusely. And so am I. And Mr. Marshall looks at Tommy his son and I don't say a word and start following this man to his place of employment and Tommy just started running to this day I can't tell you where he ran to um, I ran too I went home to my mother and I tried to explain to my mother what I had just seen and my mother tried to or show me what I hadn't seen, try to tell me, try to clean it up. Mm -hmm. She didn't want me to be embittered by this experience. Mm -hmm. And so she was telling us that, you know, Mr. Marshall works for this guy and was trying to explain it. But when you're five or six years old, this man, Marshall, who was extraordinarily strong, um, look so weak. Mm -hmm. Those who hear this story knows of the sociology of the times and they'll try to explain, well, this is before the civil rights movement. This is when black men had very little option and they'll try to explain it. But the problem is the sociology of the times will not explain that to a little boy who had so much respect for his father. Mm -hmm. Tommy never again, ever, told me that his father was stronger than mine. Tommy's uh, father lost that glint that he once had, that commanding presence. Mm -hmm. And it was my really first experience with racism. And what I saw was undulterated racism. I saw a black man being humiliated in front of his wife, his son, and his son's best friend, I saw what it looked like to have someone emasculated. Mm -hmm. And I never forgot that. It had an incredible experience. 
um, it changed my whole view of everything. Because up until that time, I lived on the farm, and generally, any time we saw white people, quite candidly, in Davidsonville, mm -hmm. was when we went to Annapolis to go mm -hmm. shopping on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Everything was self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. Everything. We grew our own food. Um, clothing was made by our parents. We had no reason. But this was my really first introduction to that form of racism. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward to when you when you uh, ended up going to key school because right. you were thrown out. What happened there? Well, um, to appreciate what I'm about to tell you is to understand the times in which we're living. At Annapolis High School, the old Annapolis High School, they would have assemblies, but the school was so large, 1,500 students, you couldn't have all 1,500 students together at the same time. You had to have 500 at a time. You had to have three assemblies. Mm -hmm. So I went to an assembly at Annapolis High School, and I'll never forget it. I mean, this is in the 70s. I mean, this is the black power movement. This is black consciousness. Uh, this is a kind of new militancy in terms of part of blacks. So we go into the generals, go into the Maryland Hall, and at the Maryland Hall, uh, the place is packed, and they had a white country band playing. In fact, everybody on the stage was white. Mm -hmm. And this black student shouted out, we want some soul music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was loud enough so everybody could hear. And the president of the Student Government Association took the microphone and said, this is our assembly. We've put this program together. Anybody who don't like what we're doing, you can leave. Mm -hmm. And this silence went over. Very. What, what percentage do you think was, was African American was versus fourth. white? Mm -hmm. Fourth. One fourth of the. One fourth was black. Was okay. African American. And maybe it took me 10 seconds mm -hmm. to realize what he just said is right. If you don't like it, leave. Mm -hmm. So I got up to leave, and in those days at Maryland Hall, when you got up, the seat would flap up. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting up, and I'm leaving, and as I'm walking out, flap, 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 mm -hmm. flap. And 150 students, black students, mm -hmm. followed up to protest. Um, <clears throat> and as a result of that, we started asking other questions, like, why don't we have a black studies program? Mm -hmm. Why isn't black history taught at Annapolis High School? And you got to appreciate that Annapolis High School was only integrated in 1966. So four years later, you had this influx of students, black students coming. Uh, and then we decided to protest. And the protest was we would show up to school and have what we call freedom classes. Uh, we just wouldn't go to class. We'd go into the cafeteria and share our experiences. Well, one day, the school system decided, after meeting with us, a guy named, a man named uh, Roger Moy, who was the mayor of Annapolis, hmm. a guy named um, Zashville Sims, and Walter Blassingay came to meet with Roger us. Roger Moore was Pitt Moyer? Yes, Pitt yeah. Moyer. And they came to meet with us because we had been doing this protest for two weeks at Annapolis High School. And they were trying to convince us to go back to class. And uh, Pip Moria spoke, Sam Gilmer spoke, Water Blasting Game spoke, Zashro Sim spoke. And every time they talked about going back to class, nobody would move, mm -hmm. wouldn't budge. So finally, this guy named Walter Blassingame, who was then the education chair of the NAACP, said, if you all go back to class, we can have these problems addressed in the next month. And people said, oh, one month, that's <laughs> too long. <laughs> yeah, we can't wait that long. So finally, he said, if you go back to class in two weeks, we'll have the problem solved. Mm -hmm. And again, people were protesting two weeks seemed too long. But as I was thinking about it, two weeks didn't seem like a long time. And so I got up and addressed the crowd 
and said we should go back to class because these promises they made would take place in two weeks. It's why I learned in my generation never trust anybody over the age of 30 because once we went back to class, uh, they didn't implement any of the promises they made. And eventually, when we saw that nothing was happening, we decided to stage a new protest. This would be on the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. That date was chosen for a purpose. So we had this protest that turned into a melee. And windows got broken, and they called it a riot. The, print, the superintendent of schools was a man named Edward Anderson. Fourteen of us got expelled as a result of that demonstration. Hmm. Another 150 students were suspended. And um, Dr. Anderson told my mother that as long as I'm superintendent of these schools, your son, Carl, will never go to a public school. Hmm. And he kept his promise. I never went back to a public school. Mm -hmm. I wound up going to Key School, which mm -hmm. was a private school, thanks in large part by people in the community who literally took up a contribution so I could continue my education. No kidding, huh? So, so, so uh, you'd made a reputation for yourself at that point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So, so, um, and then, I, you know, we don't have time to go through every, I mean, I hadn't heard I hadn't heard that full story, um, especially the part about in the theater getting up and walking out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but there's there's a lot of history. Let's go way way fast forward to okay. I'm county executive. Yeah. <laughs> the stuff that we've done together, right? And we've been through a lot together. Um, we've had quarterly meetings with the caucus. We we I mean we're we're doing a lot of things. Um, I want to get into a few of them, and probably the first one that I thought I, I, I thought was a big win was um, when you got together with NAACP and y'all came up with this idea that young pe if young people wrote letters to members of the of the of the county council, um, body worn cameras might actually happen. I had talked about it in the first budget, but didn't didn't feel like we had the votes on the council to do it. I hadn't gotten a lot of interest. Um, but then between that 2019 budget and that, well, during the year of 2019 and leading up to 2020, um, these amazing personal letters came from hundreds and hundreds of students going to all the council members and me um, with their personal reasons why they think that the officers should, should have body-worn cameras. And uh, what was the result of that? Yeah, yeah. Well, we got body-worn cameras, but probably more importantly even, it was really educational. You know, for a long time, People literally believed it was between the police officer and a community representative. Always believed the police. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These body cameras put an end to that. Mm -hmm. Body cameras actually saw how people interacted with the police and that um, the police were not always as um, polite, <laughs> to say the mm -hmm. least, as people portrayed them to. So those body cameras really was revolutionary. Because they did two things. One, they allowed people to see the actual interaction, mm -hmm. and they served to also exonerate police officers. Mm -hmm. Because if someone had alleged that the police officer did XYZ, you got the body camera, wasn't there. In right. fact, uh, there was an example where this happened in Annapolis, but the same concept applied. There was an allegation that a police officer took $1,400 off of a civilian, a local drug dealer. And the local drug dealer made that allegation. The police said it's not true, blah, 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 blah. It turned out that had it not been for a camera, a video camera, at a convenience store that captured the whole thing, mm -hmm. you literally see this police officer mm -hmm. taking the money, literally, mm -hmm. even though he had denied yeah. ever taking it. An investigation is undertaken. Um, the police officer has to now admit that he did take the money. Mm -hmm. He said he put it in the trunk of his car, and it just disappeared, which meant that the only one that would have access to it would be other police officers. Long story short, he had to resign, mm -hmm. actually retired. Um, but that's, again, an example of how videos yeah. could be very helpful. Well, and it was shocking to me that... Um when those letters started coming in, uh, 
it was a race between, at that time, the, the Republicans were calling themselves the council GOP. Yeah, that yeah. was a new thing. It was a three to four split on the council. And um, they put out a joint letter saying, we want body-worn cameras um, to try to beat the Democrats to it. And <laughs> so it was a race to see who could make it happen faster. And then, um, and the program has been very popular among police officers. Um, the uh, state's attorney loves it because she's got evidence to take to court. It's fine. The truth, right. you know, transparency. Um, and, and I got to credit those students. Um, I mean, later the state of Maryland required all jurisdictions to have body-worn cameras, but this, this was before that. Um, so I, it was interesting to me when, um, after George Floyd's murder, when uh, we had one, we, we did a lot of listening sessions and events. One of them was, was called, I think, Young and Black in Anne Arundel County, and it was all young folks. And um, I heard over and over again that people wanted more education about black history, local black history, in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Same issue they were right. talking about when yeah. you were in school. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there's been some progress, but um, but at least there's a thirst and uh, um, well, for we're, knowledge. We're very, very fortunate, very fortunate to have Dr. Mark Waddell as superintendent of schools. Mm -hmm. He's not only a visionary, but he's someone who gets it. And what I like about uh, Dr. Waddell's leadership is he understands in order for students to excel, all students have to excel. Mm -hmm. He really understands that as a concept. And he's data-driven, mm -hmm. focused like a laser beam, and uh, we're very fortunate to have him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he, um, I've talked to him about the opportunity gap and the kids that have not been achieving and trying to get them their scores up and get them engaged in school. and. Um, but he always makes a point of also talking about the high achieving kids and making sure that they achieve even higher. And, and, uh, and that to me, and he's dealing with parents who, right. who are concerned about their kid. That's all they, you know, they care about their own kid. And is my child getting as good an education as possible? And, um, and when I think about uh, the county outside of the school system, the whole big picture, I try to, I try to, to do the same thing that if, if we can, if we can get the folks that are um, living in poverty, don't have adequate housing, don't have adequate transportation, um, literally, or the Alice population, which is the sort of next level up, which is about a third of our county living paycheck to paycheck. Um, if, um, if we can make sure that life is better for them, they're better educated, they have um, childcare, they have the basic things that make them a great workforce, then our whole economy benefits from it. Um, and I go to the bond rating agencies and I say, I say, you know, here are the things we're doing to confront poverty. And that's what you should be thinking about. That climate impact and about whether Anne Arundel County is a good investment over the next 50 years. And uh, uh, so it's, it's interesting to see it in the school system and, and outside. Um, but, um, okay, uh, last question, I think. Um, no, second to last, one more I want to ask you about. Compromise. So, younger people, and I'm sure you were you when you were younger, um, impatient, like you said. Four months, for a month is too long. <laughs> two two weeks is too long. Um, <clears throat> turned out they were right because it sometimes it's forever. But um, uh, have you? How do you explain to younger people that sometimes you don't always win everything, and you you got to get what you can, and you move on? Do you? Do you, as the kind of old, older person, the mentor, have that conversation much? Yeah, and again, that's why history is so important. Mm -hmm. If people understood history, uh, some of the greatest movements that we've had took decades, not days, decades to take place. Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered in 1968, April of 1968. The first bill to make Dr. King's birthday a national holiday was put in place on April 15th, 1968, 11 days after he died, by a man named John Conyers. Mm -hmm. And every year, yeah. yeah, every year, they kept putting the bill in, putting the bill in. Mm -hmm. That bill did not become, uh, did not become law until eight, 1983. Mm -hmm. And who should sign the bill in 1983? Ronald Reagan. Hmm. And Ronald Reagan was on record as saying, he reluctantly signed the bill because at that time, 
a guy named Jesse Helms from North Carolina was calling Dr. King a communist and <laughs> saying horrible, horrible things. The FBI did a smear campaign. But from 1968 to 1983, just time and time again, when you know about the history of Nelson Mandela, who, by the way, was honored by the Anne Arundel County Council when he passed, uh, he was in prison for 27 years. They didn't happen overnight. So oftentimes what you have to share with people is a sense of history and that it takes a while. Okay, okay. So here's, here's the, the big one. Uh, since you talk about history all the time and you, you go back a ways, you're not that much older than me, but you... How, yes. Yeah, I won't ask. But, uh, um, and this is, the, this is a question I used to ask my father before he died too, because he would go back in, in history and talk about it, is uh, I think the people who've seen the most have the better, better way to predict the future than the rest of us. So the question is, uh, 10 years from now, um, what do you what what do you envision for the county, the state, the country, how, whichever part you think? Uh, Three weeks from now, okay, it's going to decide that. It's going to be something called a presidential election. Mm -hmm. um, in my lifetime, there's no election that's been more consequential than this election. Depending on what happens three weeks from now, we're doing this three weeks before the election, November fifth. People are already casting ballots. Everybody's talking, but it's going to be a close election. Mm -hmm. um, when I was younger, I thought that I'd be more concerned about with things in the past. You hear me often talk about history. Mm -hmm. But after having um, children and a granddaughter, I'm more interested in the future, mm -hmm. what the future will look like for them. And uh, we uh, have a challenge. But I'm not convinced that we will necessarily go forward. There have been parts of our history where we have taken. On backwards. Went backwards and had to fight to move forward. Um, this is probably, for me, of all the elections I've been voting since I was able to, there's no election that I can think of that is so clear what the values are. You know, you have a GOP who's very clear with his standard bearer what kind of America it would have. And you have a woman who's never held, never been president, no woman has ever served, and what that might represent. Real clear choices, very, very clear choices. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know what the future will bring. I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, mm -hmm. but I've also seen in my lifetime things occur. My daughter, my granddaughter, lost her right reproductive rights. Something that for 50 years we thought was finished business. Mm -hmm. She lost that. Um, I was on with Asha earlier today. We were talking about the whole DEI. Mm -hmm. Where are we going as a society on that particular mm -hmm. question? So I think when the election takes place, we'll be all in a better position to be able to see where we're going as a nation. Well, um, this has been a, it has been a fascinating series of stories yeah. is really what it is because you're the storyteller. There's a whole lot of things I want to get to, but there's no way we have time for all of that. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the power of writing, the power oh, of yeah. public speaking, and how you do that. Um, you've learned a lot of lessons over the years. Um, well, um, uh, thank you again no, thank for, you. for coming and doing this. And um, um, for all the listeners, I hope you come back next week and uh, Remember to hit the Pittman and Friends subscribe button and uh, see who, um, who we've got up next to, to join us. Thank you.